Yes. So Monday, in the first series of these lessons, we studied about out of fashion from 1 Peter 1, verse 14, about how God is holy, and if we want to see God, we have to be holy too. And we talked about fashioning our intellect, fashioning our emotions, and fashioning our desires after our holy God. And then in the second lesson yesterday in the series, we talked about um, discarded fashions from 1 Peter 2, the first three verses. And uh, God has always been interested in how his people dress. Always. We grow as a Christian and it really takes spiritual maturity to submit to God's will about our clothing, especially in 2023 America. I shared how we went to uh, Africa back in August and into September and you know, you want to you want to find out what the customs are wherever you go so that you can comply and, um, you know, ha give God's people a good name. I wanted to represent that well, even though wearing a conga or a dress all the time in public is not our custom. But I wanted to do that. And as Christians, some fashions go out of style forever. When we become a Christian, like we, we looked at, and, and poor little say goodbye to mannequin Margie. She's going to leave today. But I poked her hard right here several times yesterday, putting those malice and guile and all those fashions go out of style when we become a Christian. Uh, hypocrisies, uh, envies, evil speakings, and all of that, they go out of style and they don't come back. We don't want to keep those so that they come back. So the last installment in the series of fashion lessons today is interior fashions, the hidden man of the heart. So if you want to turn to 1 Peter 3, we'll look at, at those two verses. Too. And you know, whether we want to admit it or not, we make judgments about people based on what they have on. Does anybody want to prove me wrong? We make judgments about people when we see them in three seconds, right or wrong, I have already sized this person up. <laughs> I, I'm just being honest. I'm a real person. I'll just tell you stuff about me. I think you do too. It might take you longer than three seconds, but we do. Uh, based on our outward appearance. Now, uh, a few years ago, I was in a music store buying a CD for somebody. And I was upstairs in the mall, and there was this guy, and I'll just describe him. He had tattoos on every inch of skin that I could see. I'm not, I'm not saying anything about getting a tattoo. I'm just saying this was his description. He had uh, safety pins in his eyebrows and in his nose. And, and I was thinking, ow, uh, pins in the side of his face and different things. He was really, you know, jeweled up. He was bedazzled. You know, that, remember that thing? And uh, so there was this guy the same age of me. We were in our 50s. And he was just staring at him. And I thought, oh, this is going to get awkward. He was really staring at him, looking at him, and he was checking him out. So finally the clerk says, the clerk with the tattoos and the pen said, what are you looking at? And I was like, ah. And the guy said, I'm looking at you. You're a freak. <laughs> and they got into it. I decided I needed to look at the tape some more. <laughs> yeah, I don't like confrontation. <clears throat> but. He was making, this, this might have been the nicest guy you ever met, but that guy was making a, a judgment based on his outward appearance, and frankly, so was I. I just wasn't going to talk to him about it. Go to Walmart any Saturday. You'll see what's in fashion. <laughs> Things you never dreamed possible. People that didn't bother to get dressed after they were in the bed. <clears throat> People who really need a good supportive bra on, and they don't have one <laughs> on tank tops and all kinds of things like what happened to your mirror yeah, I'm so critical about myself before I go out because I have a mirror and I just oh I just wonder about it. I know we shouldn't judge a book by its cover but we do God's the only one that can see what the heart is like the rest of us just have to look at what we've got first Samuel 16 verse 7 says but the Lord said unto Samuel look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? On the heart. Our loving God has put warnings in place in his word that tell us how to behave, that tell us how to live, that tell us how to present ourselves in the world. 
And every warning or rule he has lovingly given us is always for our benefit. Okay, who's playing music? <laughs> I'm so easily distracted. And this lesson today is about how we dress. And yes, there are words from God about how we're to dress. And number one, let's call it fashion advice. They're always going to be fashion something today. First Peter 3, our key verses say, Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of putting on of apparel, but instead let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. And so in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 1, right before these verses, he turns our minds back to the previous chapter. He reminds us that you might, gonna, you might be suffering in some way too, unjustly. But he reminds us that the Savior suffered unjustly. But even so, he was in submission to the Father. And likewise, wives should be in subjection to their husband, even an unfair husband. All right, and then the likewise part, wives aren't to be slaves, as in the case of servants, 1 Peter 2, 18. They're to be in subjection as faithful wives. The wife's not a slave. First, to be faithful to God, and the wife is a companion, not a slave. You know, when in the Garden of Eden, when everything was perfect, and God made it, and he said it was very good, Adam and Eve were partners. They were perfect. The wife and the husband, the husband and the wife, and they just had each other. They got along really well because there were no in-laws. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, had to throw that in. Um, but they were perfect, and Eve was created, the crown of the creation, that husband and wife. And then over time, you know, just like man does with everything, man messed it up. And in the Old Testament, the, the wife is viewed as, you know, cattle, a property to be owned. But in the New Testament, if you notice, Paul and Peter and the other people who wrote about this, they sought to restore woman back up to that lofty position where she was, where she was in Ephesians. So she had been trampled on and, and it, was, it had been abused, but they sought to put her back up. Love your wives. And all the admonitions they're given. So it was very different. Man was created with a purpose. It was a priority. It was proper. And they were prepared. But in doing so, this be in subjection means having the proper respect for the order that God set in place. Isn't our God an orderly God? Let everything be done decently and in order. Everything has an order. Man was chosen. He didn't have to, but he gave us a couple of reasons. Why? Because Eve was in the transgression. Adam was created first. He didn't have to tell us any of that. But listen, if woman was in charge of the home, the head of the house, wouldn't we be sitting here today saying, wonder why the woman was in charge and not the man? You know, uh, Shakespeare said it best, actually, if two men ride on a horse, one must ride behind. It doesn't mean we're second-class citizens. It means somebody's got to be in charge and make the last decision. Actually, I'm glad that's not me, because Eddie Gilpin's going to have to stand in front of the throne of God one day and give an account for how our house was run and how our children were raised, I don't. I have to stand in front of God and give an account of how much I helped him do that or I hindered him from doing that. So we all have our place. And some of the things I'm going to say today are going to make feminist heads blow off because they don't like hearing a lesson on wives being in subjection to your own husbands. I taught in the college uh, area, environment, mostly with women, female professors, and I was just the weirdest thing to them. Feminists hate strong, knowledgeable Christian women who are in subjection to their God. They hate us. If you're that, they hate you too. And so I look like, and I am, I am a strong, independent woman. I can do a lot of things, and I was there with them, writing, reading research, presenting research and at different conferences. 
But then yet I was in subjection to God first and to my husband. And, you know, I don't just take a job in Florida and move to Florida whether he wants to or not. I just don't do that. And they would be like, what? And so they hate hearing about this. Um, God has always cared what his people look like. I said that. In the garden, in Genesis 3, 7, after Adam and Eve sinned, they realized they were naked. And it says in verse 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, you know what kind of what an apron covers, right? Those, those cooks. I just have aprons because um, they're pretty, and I hang them up. <laughs> in verse 10, And he said, Adam, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. You know, the blame game started. The punishments were doled out. But notice this. They covered themselves. They made themselves aprons. But in Genesis 3, verse 21, it says, Unto Adam also and unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. They made themselves aprons, but they weren't really properly clothed until God did it. Some animals had to die, some blood had to be shed, and, they, and God clothed them with coats of skin. Adam and Eve thought they were clothed. But looking at the world about us, our fashion advice isn't always correct. God's fashion advice is the best, is always the best to ask for. He created us. He knows us. Those desires and those things that are naturally put inside of us, he put them there. And they were for a reason. But like I said, with everything, God, uh, man has a way of just messing everything up. Um, he sent his only begotten son so that we could live. And he doesn't want bad fashion advice to cause us to stumble and give in to temptation. You know, after, after the sin in the garden, the innocence was gone. Um... Uh, have you ever nailed a, a nail in, into a post? We live out in the country and that happens a lot. And you can take the nail out of the post, but what's going to still be there? The hole's still there. You can't patch that up. So the innocence in the garden, God had a plan. He always had a plan. In the mind, in eternity, he's always had the church in his mind. That was not plan B. But they messed it up, and the innocence was gone. You know, being naked for them was no longer in fashion. Some things had changed, and they needed God's fashion advice. And have you ever thought about it? If they needed to be clothed more with animal skins, and they were the only two people on the planet, there wasn't anybody else there to see them. If they needed to be clothed more with animal skins, how much more should we give thought to what we're wearing with a few billion people on the earth? What innocence we've lost in the United States. And that was always something I tried to keep my kids just as innocent and believing in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, you know, as long as I could. Um, but my dad was old school. And I, I wish we could go back, you know, several decades to where we were, but we can't. My dad was old school. And when my brother, they had a little girl, she was a tiny little baby. And, you know, you're just taking like 3,000 pictures of the baby the first week. You know, and so she was in the bathtub in the little baby thing, and we were snapping pictures of her. And, oh, look, Daddy, look how cute she is. Look right here. And we had not put a rag over her. And he said, you, you tear that up. And, and my mother said, Richard, it's a baby. He said, I don't care. You tear that up. Anything that showed her all the way down here, he, he destroyed it. Those pictures were gone. That, that's, that's where I wish we were. But anything goes, you know, for us. So we need, we're going to get some fashion advice from God today. We're going to have a fashion show. No, I'm not going to be modeling any clothes for you. I'm, I, just, I'm, I did good getting dressed today once. But we're going to be discussing what we put on or what we don't put on. In verse 3 and 4 that we read earlier, the emphasis on, is on the importance of the soul. It's on the opposite of the physical, which is so often emphasized today. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, the cross is an instrument of execution. You die to yourself. Take up your cross. It's not a burden to be born. 
It's death. The cross is a symbol of death. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world, finish it, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Deny himself stands out to me. So we get up every day and we say, not what I want, but what you want. Who else said that? Christ said it, even to the Father as part of the Godhead. Not my will, but yours. So we get up every day and we put Jeannie to death. What I want, what I want to say, what I want to do, what I want to wear, I'm going to put that to death. And I'm going to concentrate on what God wants for me. If your God lets you do what you want to do, then your God is you. And that's what we go by in the United States of America now. We even, um, uh, in college at, at Virginia Tech, when I was teaching there, I, I never had heard this before. Uh, apparently, there's big T truth and little t truth. There might be some big truths that we all go by, but I've got a little t truth, and if this is my truth, you can't tell me that that's wrong. You ever heard that before? I thought this is so weird. I thought there's truth and lies. I thought there was only two things. So... Um, Anyway, uh, regardless of what they say, there is still truth, and it's written in his word. And we can choose, you know, it's like being a Christian. You can choose to be a Christian or not, but once you do, there's some things that you're no longer in charge of. It's like worship. You can choose to worship God or not. It's up to you. But once you choose to worship, he regulates it. He gets to say what we do and what we don't do and how we do it. So can you lose your own soul how, over how you dress and present yourself? If so, nothing is worth that. Our fashion statement is important, and we like clothes, we're women, we like something different, this color looks good on us, and that sort of thing. But it needs to be by the approval of God. It doesn't matter whether or not we want to be in a fashion show every day. We are, whether we want to or not. Somebody's watching us. Uh, some younger person, some younger woman is watching you just like you used to look up to and watch older people. Somebody's watching how we conduct ourselves, how we present ourselves, how we dress, how we present ourselves to the world. And we definitely don't want to be the person that they go home either to parents or a husband and say, well, Jeannie wears it. You know, she's, apparently she thinks it's okay to wear that. We're influencing people all the time. Now, let's be real. This can be taken too far because somebody doesn't like or doesn't approve or doesn't think you should be wearing this or that. It can be taken too far. We can't go around, you know, just everybody's opinion. And Well, maybe one person says, uh, I don't like that she wears pants in, to church. You know, she's got a suit on. It's a pants suit. She's been to work, and the blazer and the pants match, and she came. I don't like that. Uh, I don't think a woman should ever put on jeans. You know, just because somebody has an opinion about something doesn't mean we, oh, I, I got to stop doing that because that bothers sister so-and-so. There's a fine line there, and I, I don't know where that is for you. But we can't worry about everybody's opinion. Uh, where's the line where your nose ends and my business begins? Uh, huh, it's somewhere. And if it really became a problem with someone, you know, disagreeing with some article, particular article of clothing, you know, I, you know, you might just kindly suggest maybe you should talk to the elders, you know, about what, what their standards are. Maybe, I, maybe I'm not aware of their standards, you know, and kind of that, that is their purview. But to a certain extent, that's between us and God. You know what I'm saying? I hope you know what I'm saying. But God created us. He put within a man the desire to recreate. Uh, inside that desire is a man is stimulated by sight. We are not. Um, at night when we're getting ready for bed, you know, if I'm undressing, Eddie Gilpin is stimulated by the sight of me, regardless of how bad I think I look. And it doesn't work that way for me. When I see him undressed, the only thing I can think of is, the next time I'm in Walmart, I have got to pick him up some more underwear. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm just not, 
<laughs> I'm not even anywhere close to where he is. That's the way we were made. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and for wives that shame their husbands because of that, they're terrible people. Uh, that's not what this is about. But we have to remember that, though, when we go out in public. And we do have a responsibility there sometimes. And mothers, when daddy says at the door, little Susie shouldn't go out in that. I don't like that. Don't, take, don't start fussing at him. He knows how guys think. I didn't have any girls. But that was what I was planning on doing. Eddie says, I didn't want that second one to be a girl. I said, why? He said, I was afraid y'all would gang up on me and stuff like that. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, me and little Susie would have already had the knockdown out back before you ever saw her. I would have been tougher on her than you would have been. But anyway, we didn't. We had two boys. But um, by the same, same token, if your husband feels a little bit uncomfortable about something you're wearing, too low, too much shoulder, a little short. I, you might look and say, what? Just go change and just trust him on this. He knows how they think. He's not just trying to make your life miserable. He's trying to help you. He's trying to help them. But women, we're created as uh, nurturing creatures, and we need to hear things from him. That's, that's by design. But men, our Christian brothers, are trying to stay pure, and we aren't helping them. Uh, with these things that we're wearing or not wearing. And then I hear this statement from very immature Christians. Well, I'll wear what I want to, and if anybody of them has a problem with it, that's their problem. That's not my problem. And I think, oh dear, no. Actually, that's a heart problem is whose problem it is. But there are some obvious fashion faux pas, I guess we'll call them, that we cannot make. We have to have some fashion sense. <laughs> We can be in fashion or out of fashion. Fashions in the world come and go. I said I wish I'd kept all my 70s clothes because they're back. I wish I had my bell bottoms. Jellies, yo-yos, penny loafers. I had some really cool penny loafers. Um, sundresses, the Farrah hair. Oh, I had it all. Poodle skirts. <clears throat> And even though the world's fashions come and go, we can always be in fashion with God and we can still look good. It's possible. I mean, me and Cindy are rocking it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't have to have one at the exclusion of the other. You can be both. We can be in fashion on the outside and in fashion on the inside at the same time. In our American culture, the emphasis is uh, definitely on the outside. Definitely. What do we take off? Too much. And what do we put on? Things we shouldn't. I taught middle school and college. You cannot shock me anymore. You just can't. And I have no fear either because I taught in the, both those places. You just can't shock me. And I have, uh, I need some Botox right up here because I've gone like this so much. <laughs> I have done that too much and I have these wrinkles up here. Have you ever heard when in Rome do as the Romans do? Uh, when on vacation do as the vacationers do? When with my friends do as the friends do? Is that, should that really be our, our motto, our fashion sense? Not where Christians are concerned. You know, the Greeks loved the human body. You know all those statues that's kind of hard to look at? <laughs> like, whoa! <laughs> the Greeks were obsessed with the human body. They even ran races in the nude. And God's people couldn't participate in this fashion culture. They were different. 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, not odd, peculiar, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We try to, to quote this verse to our two sons often. You can't, we're not a member of the swim club. You can't go to the prom. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't go with these people because you're a chosen generation. We're different. Guess what? Mom and Daddy don't get invited to all the cool parties either because we're, we don't fit there. It's okay. We're different. We're going to heaven. We don't, we don't need all that. And I'm, I'm going to keep you from it too. God's people can't be dressing like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world. We're different. We, and we should be living that and teaching our children. You know, in Matthew 5, 16 through 18, where it talks about being salt and light, if you've ever thought about that, salt is a preservative. 
It also comes from the same word that, they, that we get our word salary. People were paid in salt a lot of times. It was not as common as the table salt that we have. And they were given a bag of salt. Somebody noticed that the salt was the same color as the sand. In Tanzania, the sugar is brown because we don't do all these harmful things to it. They don't do all these harmful things to it that we do. So it's brown. It was the same color as the sand. Well, somebody noticed that and they just thought, well, I've used a little bit of salt. I'll just cut my salt with a little sand. Nobody will know it and I'll have more buying power. And the next person did it and the next person did it and all you've got is a bag of sand that was good for nothing but to throw out. You're the salt of the earth. If the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be thrown out and trodden among the foot of men. We're supposed to be the salt and, and taste good and be pure. Uh, ye are the light of the world. You know how if you were in the biggest auditorium you could think of and somebody flipped on a flashlight right over here in the corner, you could see it everywhere and it could lead you to them. You're the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the, the, the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it on a, under a bushel but upon a candlestick. And it gives light to all that are in the world. He's encouraging us, be, know who you are, be who you are, and be that for everybody to see. And it influence them. So people around us see how we present ourselves and they make judgments about who we are. Now yesterday I said, uh, what does my dress say about me? And everybody was afraid to say anything. And then I turned it and I said, okay, what does it not say about me? And they said, you're not available. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm not, but I think you already knew that about me. How can we as his people be salt and light and we just look like everybody else? What's allowed today in our American culture as far as dress? Anything. Absolutely anything. You want to go to school in your pajamas? You look cute. If you want to go and wear your bathing suit downtown to go grocery shopping, go girl. It's like, what in the world? In America, we are encouraged not to deny ourselves anything. Don't deny yourself. Go for all the gusto. You only go around life once. Get it. You want it? Get it. And we're encouraged also to take off as much as we can without being absolutely naked. Only if it's an inch or two of material. Things that we should take off. All right. Things that call attention to ourselves. Our emphasis is on hair. All right, let's talk about hair a minute. Y'all know that at 61, I'm not a natural blonde, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Never was a blonde. I was a brunette, brunette. But we color our hair and we highlight our hair and we change the style. Sometimes the bigger, the bolder. We had big hair in the 70s. Our teachers used to tell us the ozone layer was, had a hole in it and it was our fault for all the hairspray. They were such liars. But we liked big hair. I don't think big hair is coming back. It might. Our emphasis is on jewelry. I like jewelry now. More jewelry, expensive jewelry, diamonds, a bigger jewelry box, tattoos. I think tattoos are considered jewelry, like we're ornamental, or ornamenting ourselves. Uh, the emphasis is on purses. I make a, well, I can't say this now because I really like Dooney and Burke purses. Um, I used to say, I don't ever want to carry a purse that's, that's cost more than the money I've got inside of it. <laughs> but I'm broke most of the time, so I can't say that it is. Uh, Hermes purses and Coach and Kate Spade and Louis Vuitton and all that stuff. We like that stuff. Our emphasis is on what we've got. Our fingernails. Time spent at the salon, acryl I, everything I'm naming, I have done at one time. Acrylics, gel, the pedicure every month, the fingernails every two weeks, the manicure. The emphasis is on the clothes. And where do we get our clothes? At the same store where the people in the world get their clothes. Whatever the world's wearing, low cut, high split, bathing suits, high heels, skin tight, off the shoulder, whatever. Whatever the style is, we want to be in style. Is there anything wrong with any of this stuff in and of itself? Say no, because I told you I've done all of them. <laughs> the bathing suit would be out. Can we all agree on that? I mean, if it's the normal bathing suit that we see, I think that would be out. Are there things you can put on and go play in the ocean? And uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Got to be careful about going to the pool, though. We told our boys, 17-year-old boys, don't have any business down at the pool where other people in the world are wearing next to nothing. Or the, the pool, the water park, or whatever, where people are naked. You don't belong there. I, I know, you're unhappy, go to your room so I don't have to look at you being unhappy. Uh, one time I told one of them, I taught middle school so I learned all the, all the phrases. Oh, you mad? Here's a cape, now you super mad. <laughs> now, go, because I'm not talking about it, I don't negotiate with terrorists, this is just the way it is. So the bathing suit's out, right? I was so disappointed about two months ago in this little newlywed couple. And he grew up part of the time at where I have been before where Eddie and I worked. And his family, his mom, his, his dad and his stepmom, there's a blended family. And all the grown kids and their spouses, if they had one, and they all went to Mexico. And when they came back, they were sharing their pictures of Mexico. And there she was, the wife, she's been a wife of his for all of eight months. And she was in a bikini. They're members of the church. And it was on fake book. And I saw it and I said, what in the round world are you thinking? And I, t I told Eddie, I said, I'm not going to show it to you, but this is what happened. And he's, what are people thinking? Well, it was about three days and that disappeared. So I hope some godly elders said something and it got taken down anyway. But I was so disappointed. I mean, most of the time the bathing suits are smaller than your underwear you have on. You remember, there used to be a cartoon, it's like old as I am, and the doorbell rings, and there's a picture of a slip and a bathing suit. And the slip says, oh, I can't answer the door, I'm not dressed, and the bathing suit says, I'll get it. You know, it's a two-piece bathing suit, which is less than the slip. Is there anything wrong with having a tattoo? Oh, now y'all gonna be quiet. Is there anything wrong with having a tattoo? In the Bible, can you find a verse that says, don't get a tattoo? I, I'm going to have to disagree. But there is something wrong with gossiping and judging somebody that has a tattoo. I, w I won't do it. My daddy always said, don't you, uh-uh, don't you, little girl. It wasn't in fashion in the 70s. My daddy said, you don't put a bumper sticker on a Bentley. And he was teaching me, now that was his value standards, and it happens to be mine too. He was teaching me, you're valuable, you're precious. I don't want to, we don't want to ruin you like that. When I was growing up, only people had tattoos were sailors. Not advocating for them, I'm just saying that's a judgment call. And they're also forever. <laughs> tattoos are forever. Uh, is it wrong to have anything else that I named? Well, I said skin tight. It matters how we use it. There's not a particular article of clothing, except for bathing suits, I think, that I can say, don't wear that. It matters, you know, how it's cut, how it fits me. You could put it on, it looks fine on you, you could put it on me, it's too tight. It, it's too low. You know, I'm bigger than you are. It just, it doesn't, you know, I can't say this is bad, nobody buy this. It, it's a, it matters how we present ourselves. It matters where the emphasis is. You know, I've known people that were covered from their neck down to their feet down to their wrist and every it matters the size your body how you're presenting yourself how it fits you the material it's made of because modest is not calling a, attention to yourself when everybody else is dressed like we are and in comes somebody in a fur with a big feather at her cap is that modest i mean it's calling attention to herself clothes can be too tight too much too gaudy too flashy uh, at one congregation we worked with, the, one, the elders asked Eddie to preach on that women should not wear pants. Mm. Now, he was holding the horns of a dilemma, wasn't he? Well, he talked to them for a while, and he says, well, I, and I really can't do that. These women and my wife are going to work every day wearing pants. And if an article of clothing is wrong, it's wrong. Shouldn't wear it anywhere. Are we really going to go there? And they studied and talked and reasoned together about it. Some have on pants so tight, uh, they look like they were melted and poured in them. You know what I'm saying? And that gets a man's attention, a man that's not your man. They just don't leave anything to the imagination. And how much time, I'm just saying this is a judgment call, how much time 
I, I always just, I don't know who taught me this, but am I spending more time getting my outside ready than I'm spending on my Bible study and prayer that day? If so, maybe some things are out of balance. Uh, how much time is spent on the hair and rolling and or flat, flattening or going to the tanning bed? Those are bad. Uh, makeup, nails, pedicures, clothes. I like all that stuff, but it's just got to be kept in balance. And, and our money, how much money spent on that as compared to what we're giving to the Lord on the first day of the week? And could it all be better spent somebody, somewhere else? Well, that's for you to decide. I, I don't have a blanket statement about what you should do and how much you should do it. That's just going to be on you as a mature Christian to figure out and think about balancing those things. Things we should take off, things we should put on. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beseech you, I'm begging you, by the mercies of God that ye, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifice, you're giving up something, you're denying yourself something. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. After what he did for you, is that not reasonable? A reasonable request and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God how many of you have ever seen a hamburger press you put a little wad of hamburger meat in there and you close it and it makes a nice firm hamburger that's the idea behind be um, and be not conformed to this world don't let the world press you into their mold so that you look like everybody else. And transformed has the idea in the, in the original word of a beautiful butterfly that transformed from an ugly caterpillar. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, we said yesterday, your heart's not here, it's here. And once you make this up, it determines where you go, when you go, what you do, what you participate in, how you look, and everything else you do. Put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on incorruption and immortality. Christ, put on the new man, the whole armor of God. It is a shame, and I've known this in two different congregations, for a man or some men to actually quit waiting on the Lord's table on Sunday because of the low cuts and the high hemlines. Because look at what we're trying to put our minds on, and he's trying to concentrate too and do and do that at the same time, but it's, um, it, that's a real shame. And how can we put on the armor of God and of light when, when our clothes say otherwise? Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4, 8. When looking at some of the things that people wear these days, it's just really hard to feel like they're thinking on those pure things. And you know, our Christian brothers are trying their best to keep their thoughts pure. One day, you know, fake book's good, but it's like anything. It can be used bad. But anyway, one day I had just, I just had it. I had been seeing all these things on on Facebook, and I just decided I was going to make a little post. And I thought everybody I knew would agree with all of this. And I'll tell you what happened. I want to read to you what I put on Facebook. These are the four points, and then I had a few little sentences underneath each other. If you'll bear with me a minute, I want to read you. This was exactly the way. And this is no fabulous writing or anything. I just did it off the top of my head because I was just, you know, I was going to have a moment. So I said, number one, leggings are not pants. Even if you have a sweater on that sort of comes to your rear, even if they have cute prints on them, cover your rear with a long, long topper dress. I am so tired of feeling embarrassed for women when they show everything they have. To most of us, you look like you put your pantyhose on and walked out without your skirt. Now, that was number one. Number two, I wrote, I'm really tired of seeing a woman's bust falling out of her shirt. I don't want to see it, and I'm shocked that you want to show it. Sure, you can dress how you wish, but consider what it says about you. In worship, we're trying to keep our minds on pure things, and then there is your bust for all to see. There are men who have declined from passing out communion because of the view you're giving them. I know you can find a shirt to cover up completely because I can find them. Okay, that was number two. Number three. 
When did showing your underwear become fashionable? I first thought this when guys began showing their boxers and wearing their pants down. Now bra straps are color coordinated with the outfit. A peekaboo in the back of a dress is something that keeps a woman pulling at her bra and dress continuously. Please don't wear it, you're a distraction. I'm just really on a roll, aren't I? <laughs> I was just telling everybody. And number four, I said, I don't understand why females have pictures of themselves made in their underwear at the beach and then post them on Facebook. Well, okay, technically they are bathing suits, but they cover up less than your underwear. I also don't understand why fathers allow this from their daughters and think it's okay for the whole world to see their daughter half-dressed. Fathers, you know exactly how the male mind works. Help the guys out. Do you know I got pushed back from Christians, non-Christians? I got pushed back from females. I got pushed back from people that do this. I got pushed back from parents. I was like, what just happened? I know y'all all agree with all that, right? I just thought everybody would. I thought, and, and I had about 300 comments and things, and most people liked it, but there was a few that was like, you're just, and one, one Christian woman that was 40 years old, lived in a different state from me, said this. See, this attitude is why young people are leaving the church, because you just draw a hard, such a hard line on everything. I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm not going to be able to do anything with that anyway. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh... In 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4 again, let it be the hidden man, the spiritual is what's important. Let it be the hidden man of the heart, the mind. Romans 8, 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity between God. We can't trust our, we can't trust what we think. We just can't. What did Jeremiah say? I didn't write this one down. It is not in man to direct his own steps. And he said that a long time ago. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. Men can't see what God sees. And it's only natural for us to make judgments on what we see. And it's not corruptible. There's a part of you that is going to live forever. We know that, right? People that are worldly and don't think about that, I guess that's why they do some of the things they do. They just need to be taught. A meek and quiet spirit... It, t it talks about women are told to be discreet and chaste. I wonder why the men weren't told that. You know, we're different. That's another thing feminists want to do. They blur the lines between the men and the woman. And they don't want to be equal. They want to be above the man. That's what a feminist is striving for. Look at their agenda. Oh, I know a bunch of them. Uh, in Titus 2, Cindy referred to all of that. I fail to see how we can fulfill those things wearing some of the modern fashions of the day. And dress decently. Is that relative? That's a relative term, right? Decently. But I'd rather go overboard trying to do that than seeing how far I could get to the edge without falling off. But that's just me. In Proverbs chapter 7, verse 10... It says, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot. I'm just reading it from Proverbs 7.10. Yeah, I'm supposed to be there. Um, can, you, can you wear clothes? What, what are clothes that say that you're a prostitute? You know, you've walked down the street sometimes and you've seen a person, and whether she was or not, you've thought that. This says, with the attire of a harlot. Harlots, street walkers, prostitutes, whatever we call them, who give themselves in exchange for money can usually be identified by what they have on. They're, they're advertising. When I was three years old uh, in the Deep South, I grew up in the Deep South, in 1965, I would have been three years old, and people popped by your house all the time. My, my Martha Stewart mother always had a pound cake and coffee ready to push the button in case somebody came over. And so the preacher came, up, came by one night. He was out visiting. And uh, so he came in and, and said something to my mother, and, and I know this because my mother told this so often, not that I remember doing it. But he said, well, hello, little genie. Where is your daddy tonight? And I said, he's gone to find a street walker. <laughs> and mother said, 
Now, I, I do not know where, probably my mother said that. She was famous for saying a lot of things. But somehow at three, I had heard about a streetwalker. I did not know what that was, but that's what I told the preacher that night. So you can identify people by the clothing that they are wearing or they're not wearing. I want to read you something to close by a lady named Diane Walls. And I just thought this fit perfectly in our lesson about fashion and modesty today. A woman arrived in a store wearing clothes that showed her body all too well. The shop owner, being a wise older man, took a good look at her, asked her to sit down and looked her straight in the eyes. And, she said, and he said something she would never forget for the rest of her life. He said this, Young lady, everything that God has made valuable in this world is covered up and hard to find. For example, where do you find diamonds? In the ground, covered and protected. Where are the pearls? Deep in the ocean, covered and protected in a beautiful shell. And where do we find gold? Underground, covered in layers of rock. And to get there, you have to work very hard and dig deep. He looked at her again and said, Your body is sacred and unique to God, and you are far more precious than gold, diamonds, and pearls. Therefore, you should be covered too. And then he added, If you keep your precious minerals, you know what he's meaning there, like gold, diamond, and pearls deeply covered, a reputable mining organization with the necessary machines will work hard for years to mine those precious goods. First, they will contact the government family. <laughs> Second, they will sign professional contracts like a marriage contract. And third, they will professionally extract these goods and tenderly refine those precious goods as in marital life. You know where he's going. But if you let your minerals find themselves to the top of the earth's surface exposed to everyone, you will always attract many illegal miners to come, exploit illegally, and freely take those riches and leave you without the precious goods God gave you. And she ended by saying, women, you are valuable. Remember, class is more desirable than trash. So if that's true or not, she got a good lesson that day. I hope she adhered to it. So, in conclusion, we are God's creation. We should take fashion advice from Him and not from those around us. We're in a fashion show every day, whether or not we want to admit it. And it's better to be in fashion with God and out of fashion with the world. When we choose how we will look, it's not always best to win in Rome, do as the Romans do. We should get our fashion sense from God. And there are some things that we need to put on, some things we need to take off, and above all, appearances matter to a child of God. Thank you so much for your attention in this series of lessons, and I think it's lunchtime. Thank you.